Creating dungeons is probably my favorite part of being a dungeon master. I get to take a blank canvas and let my imagination just go wild. And that freedom of expression is what makes me particularly resistant to hearing people tell you what you can or can't do when creating your dungeons. When I started working on this video, I thought I'd be able to cover the most important points in a single video. But then I realized I needed to correct or at least offer a counter argument to some of what I feel is not necessarily the best advice being repeated in regard to this topic. In addition to that, I'm going to examine a little bit of dungeon design history. I'm going to show you my most recent dungeon currently in use and offer some advice to help you create better dungeons. In a future video, I'll go in depth with specific dungeon design elements as well as discussions about traps, monsters, treasures, and so on. Eventually, I'll even address the dungeon as a metaphor in psychology and the importance and meaning of the labyrinth from Greek mythology. But for now, my hope is to guide you through this topic with useful information that you just might not be hearing elsewhere. This is important to me because I feel like these videos I'm making need to be offering new information so you're not wasting your valuable time. It was this dungeon from Holmes Basic D&D that taught me how to play. I ran this dungeon over and over and over again for any of my friends that could be talking to trying out this weird new game I had just discovered. And that was in the year 1980. I think I've learned a few things playing D&D since then. First, let's agree that for the purpose of this particular video, the word dungeon could mean any area the player's characters might move around in typically for the purpose of exploration. To quote directly from the brilliant Dungeon Builder's Guidebook by Bruce R. Cordell for 2nd edition AD&D, historically, a dungeon consisted of underground chambers for the confinement of prisoners. In his guidebook from 1998, he continued to explain that dungeon means any bounded setting within which PCs interact with each other, non-player characters, traps, puzzles, monsters, and or other challenging situations. Thus, this term applies to everything from subterranean mines and burial chambers to castles, cities, and extra planar abodes. History! When looking through all the past editions, beginning with 1974's original white box D&D, I found that while dungeon design has become more sophisticated, the basics really haven't changed. In fact, I've heard several YouTubers suggest that when you start creating your dungeon, you should try to map out the first three levels. This advice seems to have first appeared in original D&D 1974's Book 3, The Underworld and Wilderness Adventures, where on page 4 they say, In beginning a dungeon, it is advisable to construct at least three levels at once, noting where stairs, traps, doors, and chimneys and slanting passages come out on lower levels, as well as the mouth of chutes and teleportation terminals. As a reminder of just how focused the game was then on dungeon exploration, the book informs us a good dungeon will have no less than a dozen levels down, with offshoot levels in addition, and new levels under construction so that players will never grow tired of it. Then from Dragon Magazine number 2, published in July of 1976, an article about creating dungeons appeared on page 12, authored by Joe Fisher, where he briefly covers the topics of entrances, traps, treasures, mapping, and monsters in your dungeon designs. He states that many game judges have the mistaken impression that there is only one entrance to every dungeon. And while playing D&D, he has discovered an entrance through an old dry cistern, another entrance that is under a pool of quicksand, and even an entrance in a simple hole in the ground. He goes on to tell us that, as far as entrances go, it makes no difference where you put it or how you disguise it, as long as the dungeons are good. But the entrances can make the castle even more interesting. I only looked through Dragon magazines and books published by TSR, not Gary Gygax's Strategic Review, nor the Dungeoneer fanzine or the White Dwarf magazines from the 1970s, which means I probably missed a few articles on the subject scattered around different unofficial publications. The next official dungeon design suggestions I found came from 1979's Holmes Basic, which says, Before players can take their bold characters on adventures into the misty, mysterious dungeons, the dungeon master must sit down, pencil in hand, 
and map out the dungeons on graph paper. There should be several levels, and each level should have access above and below, and be made up of interlocking corridors, passages, stairs, closed rooms, secret doors, traps, and surprises for the unwary. A year later in 1980, Mold Bay Basic Edition tells us, a dungeon map is usually drawn on graph paper. The map should be made in pencil so that changes can be made. Before actually drawing the map, the DM should determine the scale. The scale of a map is the number of feet each square on the graph paper is equal to. Most maps are drawn to a scale of 10 feet per square. Mold Bay then goes on to explain more about dungeon map scales. Pretty basic stuff before telling us the general shape of a dungeon is often determined by the setting. For example, a tower is usually round or square with smooth walls, while a cavern has an irregular shape and rough walls. If the DM has a good idea of where certain rooms and corridors will go, other sections of the map may be left blank to be filled in later. He then says to stock a dungeon means to fill in the general details such as monsters, treasures, and traps. Special monsters should be placed in the appropriate rooms along with special treasures. The remaining rooms can be stocked as the DM wishes. Okay, so you get the idea. I won't spend too much more of your time digging up 50-year-old articles on dungeon design, but as you can already see, many of the basics have remained unchanged since the game's earliest days. No matter your skill level as a DM, from the beginning of your design, you should know if your dungeon will have multiple levels. You should consider creating multiple entrances. You should consider creating multiple routes, corridors, or access points between the levels of your dungeon. And then consider how you plan to stock the dungeon. Which monsters might you use, and what purpose do they serve? Also, you should be thinking about what treasures are appropriate for the adventure. And in regard to handing out treasure, remember, less is more. If you later discover you gave out too little treasure, that's okay. You can make up for it. But if you give out too much and your rewards, magical or mundane, are too great, you may end up breaking your entire game. And there's really not a lot you can do at that point other than try to remove those items, which no matter how you do it, runs the risk of creating resentment. It's better to just not make that mistake to begin with. Players can't miss something they never had, but they have every right to be upset with a DM that took away their favorite new toy. Look for my full video discussing risk versus reward in the future. Then at some point, either before or after you begin thinking about the location of dungeon inhabitants, you want to be thinking about trap placement and if you'll have any traps at all. Look for my video about trap design when it's available. DM tips. Now, here's some of the counter argument stuff I mentioned in the beginning of this video. When thinking about dungeon design, I've found some of the available YouTube explainer videos might be leading you down a bad path. This can happen when somebody tries to tell you exactly what you must do or must never do. I'm not the boss of you, and neither are they. So I suggest considering the advice, but don't ever feel pressure that you might be doing something wrong. If you take nothing else away from this video, just understand that so long as you're enjoying yourself and nobody's running down the halls with a pair of scissors, there's really no wrong way. When somebody is telling you what not to do, they're telling you what they don't do. But what is right for one person might not be right for another. Sometimes you feel like a nut. Sometimes you don't. For example, there seems to be an abundance of people telling you that everything in your dungeon must make sense. And some people seem to have a poor opinion of Funhouse Dungeons because, as they would put it, they don't make sense. So let's try to understand why that is faulty logic in the context of dungeon design. Everyone who says your dungeon needs to make sense while giving you a list of things you must not do are giving out bad, though I'm sure well-meaning, information. There actually are a few real-world dungeons and even those don't all follow the everything must make sense advice. The Winchester Mystery House comes to mind, which I'll discuss momentarily. Verisimilitude is often described as similarity to the truth, and it can be an important characteristic in a work of fiction. In that context, it means the author creates a believable story by including recognizable, logical, and maybe even predictable elements. Rain is wet, ice is cold, and so on. 
But if you put a frozen lake in the middle of a desert, you haven't necessarily broken verisimilitude. There just needs to be a reason it exists, even if that reason is fantastical and explained through some magical or supernatural means. We can watch Star Trek and accept the existence of warp drive and transporters, even though our current understanding of science seems to strongly suggest that neither could ever be possible. But within that universe, they do exist and we accept it. In our fantasy adventure design, verisimilitude really just means consistency. If, for example, your heroes go to sleep on a night where gravity is real, but wake up later to discover gravity no longer exists, there just needs to be a reason why. The importance of verisimilitude is also directly tied to the importance of taking notes and keeping track of time in your adventures. Even if those notes aren't always perfect and your time records don't match to the minute. Don't let perfection be an enemy to the good enough. There's a saying, if it's worth doing, it's worth doing poorly. Sounds weird, I know. But it simply means if a task is important, it's better to do it poorly rather than not at all. I'm looking at you, Mr. Toothbrush. I'm sure you've seen the videos where people are shouting into the camera and waving their hands as they passionately tell you how not to build a dungeon. What they're really doing is telling you the limitations of their own designs and imaginations. The fact is, you can do whatever you want. There just needs to be a reason. And here's the big secret you're gonna get from this video. You don't even need to know what that reason is. Did you catch that? There needs to be a reason, true, but you don't need to know what that is. And you don't need to explain those unknown reasons to your players. I know I've told you in the past how important good descriptions are, but this is different. You've heard people say, Funhouse dungeons don't make sense. To us mortals living on Earth, that Funhouse dungeon doesn't seem to make any sense. But maybe that's just because we aren't wizards with an IQ of 200 living in a magical land where dragons are real. To reinforce this point, let's circle back to the Winchester Mystery House. That place is a real world D&D dungeon. It has all kinds of dead end halls, hidden rooms that serve no apparent logical purpose. Investigators are still finding halls and rooms in that place they hadn't previously known existed. Why was it built like that? Paranoia and superstition can lead a person to do some pretty weird stuff even in our real world. Sarah Winchester was the heir to the Winchester fortune, and she believed that she was being haunted by the vengeful spirits of all those the Winchester rifle had killed. The twisting halls and funhouse design actually served a purpose which to her seemed logical, to confuse and escape those ghosts. Since such things exist in our world, your dungeons can occasionally reflect that as well. Maybe not every single dungeon, but if you want to design a dungeon that doesn't seem to make sense to us puny, pitiful, short-lived mortals, then nobody should be telling you not to. It's okay if we don't understand it, but that 400-year-old necromancer trying to outsmart death who built it, he must have had his reasons. Now, I, I won't be telling you what not to do. What I will tell you is that when you're designing your dungeons, you must do so with purpose. If you include traps, a subject I'll fully examine in future videos, you'll want to be sure the occupants of the dungeon have a way through them or around them. And the construction of those traps should be reflective of the capabilities of those who built them. The were rats living in the sewer are likely to use simple snares, spike traps, trip lines, bear traps, and so on. While a lich's tomb might have pitch black portals that either disintegrate you outright or teleport you to a different location. In Tomb of Horrors, some of the portal traps magically change your gender. In an active dungeon, there's not likely to be a lot of insta-death traps blocking your progress, or the current inhabitants would have already been killed by those barriers. On the other hand, a tomb designed specifically to keep people out might be as brutal and deadly as your sadistic imagination could conceive. Here's a hot take. In my opinion, the Tomb of Horrors is too easy, simply because it is possible to complete it, which means the legendary all-powerful lich who built it 
really wasn't very good at defending his final resting place. Now back to dungeon design. One of the first things I do before drawing even the first dungeon wall is ask myself, what is the purpose of this place? Who built it and why? And what is it being used for now? It is here I recommend knowing what the final goal of the dungeon is. What is the final boss and what is the motivating factor for the players to be exploring it? These basic factors will guide your creation process. Additionally, the design of your dungeon will be greatly influenced by the game mechanics and genre. Obviously, a Pathfinder dungeon will be different from a Starfinder dungeon. The same is true of game mechanics. A first edition AD&D dungeon will be different than a fifth edition D&D dungeon. I'll discuss the minutia of that in my follow-up covering advanced dungeon design techniques. For now, when designing your dungeon, consider its current purpose. Is it an abandoned tomb filled with traps? Who built it and why? Perhaps it had once been a trap-filled tomb, but the treasures are now long gone and the traps neutralized. The current inhabitants use the fearsome reputation of the place to their advantage, living in relative peace. Just consider what purpose the place used to serve and what its purpose is now. Don't self-impose any limitations on your creativity. Your dungeon can be as large, small, deadly, realistic, or outright wacky as you need it to be. It could have once been a massive multi-level complex, but now, due to past wars and structural damage, only a handful of chambers remain available for exploration. I've had to use that trick several times when I don't really want to map out an entire fortress or doing so wouldn't add anything to the adventure except needless hours of pointless dungeon crawling. But if you do want to go large, there are no mandatory limits and your dungeon location might cover hundreds of miles, such as that found in a massive system of natural caves. I once ran a campaign with the player's characters trapped in the Underdark, an entire subterranean world complete with rivers, caves, tunnels, and huge cities. If your dungeon was built by giants, it could be enormous. If you're creating natural caverns, consider the Carlsbad Caverns in North America, which reportedly have over 100 known caves. The route available to tourists is approximately two kilometers in length, and one particularly large cavern known simply as the Big Room is nearly 4,000 feet long, 625 feet wide, at its highest point, the ceiling is 250 feet above your head. And that big room is the largest chamber in North America, but it's only the 32nd largest in the world. In fact, when thinking about a dungeon as a series of connected locations, this means that your entire campaign world is essentially one massive dungeon on the largest scale possible. But instead of enclosed subterranean rooms and halls, you have cities, roads, rivers, and so on. Now that you've decided the purpose for your dungeon and you have begun to draw it, you can begin to consider the creatures living there. Do they reflect the nature of those creatures living above ground? It often makes sense to have some connection, but it isn't always necessary. Just spend some time asking yourself how those living below ground affect those on the surface, if at all, and why or why not. Another important thing to consider is the dungeon's ecology. If you have a bunch of dungeon chambers filled with monsters that seem to have no source of food or water, you'll need to have some explanation for that. Frankly, there doesn't have to be a great explanation, there just needs to be one. Like maybe meals are magically delivered to the monsters on some type of schedule. Uber Eats, but for monsters. Or perhaps some enchantment over the area prevents the monsters from growing hungry or thirsty. Maybe one of the reasons I so often gravitate towards stocking my dungeons with undead is because, I don't know, maybe I'm lazy and I don't like to think much about what the inhabitants are having for lunch. But on the other hand, I often get so deep into thinking about this that my players are pretty well used to finding the areas where the monsters poop. And they've had to fight more than one poop-related monster in their adventures. Ever hear of a water weird? Well, here's a poop weird in the sewer. Ever hear of a water elemental? Well, here's a poop elemental. Those are some really stinky encounters, I know. Now, before finishing this video, let me show you a bit of the dungeon I created for our current adventure. My players are in part two of the Castle Amber adventure, and they are trying to escape the city of Bonaise, 
located in Avaron. They defeated the undead Colossus and retrieved the MacGuffin located there. But after a run-in with the city tax collectors and the fanatical witch-hunting Sisters of Wrath, they had to run into the sewers looking for an exit out of the city. On this map, the letter E indicates the different entrances and exits. These all connect to the street level. Then you'll see the letter T. These are all access points to what I call the Skulk Tunnels. Living in the sewers and among some natural caves are a colony of Skulk. These particular Skulk are more similar to the first edition AD&D origins. In this case, they were people who had to hide beneath the city to escape the cruel inquisitors. These Skulk are evil, but they're also intelligent. They are more of a nuisance than any real threat, running away from open combat, hoping to lead enemies into traps they've created. These skulk use their long claws to dig tunnels and have breached the sewer walls in some places. This has created access points to other locations beneath the city, and for the most part, the skulk tunnels are located between the first and second levels of the main dungeon. One of these skulk created breaches connects to the dungeon beneath the fortress temple of the Sisters of Wrath. If I zoom into this area, here you'll see a very simple example of how we should think about our dungeons in three dimensions. This room has a high ceiling and a balcony 12 feet above the chamber floor. There's two exits on the balcony level and three from the room's floor level. The balcony and the cages wrapped with razor wire created an interesting set of challenges with terrain features and a multi-level field of battle. Further in the dungeon are more complex examples of this technique. My players have only begun to explore the area, so I'll have to cover that in a future video. That's where I'll be discussing advanced dungeon design as well as traps because, oh yeah, the Dungeon of the Sisters of Wrath is like one of those murder porn Saw movies. While any reasonable person would want to get as far away from there as possible, my players are about to break into it. <laughs> More on that later. To wrap this up, just don't think that you need to meet any expectations. There is no right or wrong way. Creating dungeons or adventures or interesting encounters is all about you finding your voice. Imagination is like a muscle that grows stronger with exercise. Continue to experiment and don't limit your creativity. Besides, really, we're all just making this up as we go and you're allowed to as well. Look for my other campaign creation videos. And as always, I'm your host, At here at We Love TTRPGs and I appreciate your support by liking this video and letting me know in the comments if this has been useful to you. YouTube still seems hesitant to share my video, so anything that you can do to help give it that nudge is much appreciated. And thank you so much for watching. Is this good? Is it good? Are we good? Is this okay?